the title is Challenges, Needs, and Requirements Definition Management for Compact Systems, but in reality, it applies to any systems that we're developing today. I'm a past chair and current co-chair of the Requirement Working Group. Our purpose is to advance the practice of education theory of needs and requirements definition management and relationship and needs and requirements to other system engineering functions. We want to expand and promote the body of knowledge about needs and requirements and our benefits within the system engineering community. And you see, I keep saying needs and requirements, and I'll explain why I'm using two words together. And our scope is pretty broad in all these things here, including verification and validation of systems to meet our requirements and our needs. Current chair is Tammy Katz from Ball Aerospace. And I'm a co-chair, Rick Zini from Harris Corporation, Mike Ryan, University of Canberra in Australia. It's our Connect address. You can go to the Requirements Working Group Connect site. You can access all of our products on that website. And we have members from industry and academia with common purpose of improving the practice of system engineering through improving the needs and requirements definition of management. To become involved in the RWG, you know, it's a large working group. We've been very active in product development and virtual events. To get notification of our events, it's important that you join the working group so that uh, you'll get our emails. So, you know, when there's upcoming events or opportunities to contribute or review products and participate in the virtual events. Members can be very involved or minimally involved. It's up to you what role you want to have. We want to support any level of participation and interaction. You can contribute the benefit of your experience so others can learn from your experience, promote the working group itself, work in the work products, work with other working groups and organizations, and assist the leadership team with specific activities. So to join the requirement working group, you uh, log into the main and coasting site, go to your profile. In the lower left, you'll see browser join a working group. You can click that. You'll get a list of all the different working groups. You can go down to requirements and then to the right where it says view, click on view. And then at the bottom of the page, it'll say, I join this committee. One thing that's important is you have to opt in on getting emails. You need to go to your account and edit your information and other communication preferences. Make sure you opt in for working group emails. If you don't do this, you won't be getting the emails and notifications from the different working groups. We have several release products that are well known. The guide for writing requirements, our latest version was 2019. We also have white paper integrated data as the foundation of systems engineering. It came about about the same time when MBSE started coming out. In that white paper, we really make a big point that MBSC is more than just developing system models. MBSC is more focused on a data-centric practice of systems engineering, where you have integrated data that everyone works from, and I'll go into that in more detail. So now we have three major products in work. The Needs, Requirements, Verification, Validation, Lifecycle Manual is quite an undertaking. It's like 470 pages. Just like the title says, it talks about defining needs and transforming those into requirements and verification validation activities across the life cycle of, of any product. The size of the document can be a little bit intimidating. And so we have two other products that are kind of a summary of the manual. Uh, one is called the Guide to Needs and Requirements. And that focuses, just like the title says, on the needs and requirements, uh, verification and validation of those needs and requirements, management of those needs and requirements. But it's a summary of what's in the manual. So it's more of like a work instruction kind of document that people can use. And if they want more of the underlying theory and stuff behind certain things, they can go to the manual to get that information. And then we also have a guide to verification and validation. And the subtitle is Practical Guidance for Verification and Validation of Design and Systems. I'll show you a little bit later. Verification validation occurs across the life cycle and the guide to needs and requirements talks about verification validation of needs and the requirements but the guide to verification validation starts with verifying and validating the design and then the system of interest that you're developing the relationship of these products the manual is very much in sync with the Incosi system engineering handbook a lot of the sections in the new update to the systems engineering handbook I was involved in updating those ensuring they're in sync with what's in 
the manual and back and forth, and the same with the, the different guides. The white paper, integrated data, is kind of an underlying set of concepts that all of our products implement. We have on the right, it says other domain-specific guides, and this is so that if there's any domain-specific or working groups that would like to develop their own tailored guide to implement what's in the manual, then the free for them to develop their own products as well. We have our own YouTube channel. You can go to this link about the RWG. Tammy has a nice introduction to the working group. The integrated data and foundation of the SE white paper. That was actually the focus of the COSI webinar last year. I gave it several times. The talk is divided into two pieces. The first half is an overview of the contents of the white paper. The second half is a roadmap to applying what's in the white paper to help organizations go from a document-centric to a data-centric practice of system engineering. The needs, requirements, verification, and validation lifecycle manual that I'm working on and a lot of the basic concepts I've talked about today are implemented in this manual. At IW, we spend a lot of time on all the products. And you can go to our YouTube channel and there's overview and contents talk and then a basic concepts talk associated with this. To keep up with all of the things that we post on the YouTube channel, it's helpful if you subscribe and then you'll be informed as we add new content. So now getting into the presentation, when we talk about today's increasingly complex software-centric systems, we're really talking about systems like this where you have a system of interest. It's made up of multiple system elements that are organized into sub systems and so on. You can have 150 or more of these system elements within your system of interest in some of the complex systems, and they all talk in over multiple communication buses, interacting with each other, and this is almost more than the human brain can comprehend. One reason why model-based system engineering is important is so we can somehow get our hands around these more complex systems. But then we have an issue of our system of interest interacting with increasingly number of external systems and bad things can happen across those interactions. So we want to try to protect for that. And then interacting with the operating environment, which also includes the humans, the users and operators that are gonna interact with the system of interest. But yesterday's electrical mechanical systems had fewer interactions, both internally and externally. Interfaces could be shown on drawings. You could get wiring diagrams, piping diagrams. You could get uh, drawings of a connector and pin assignments. You know, stuff that we can see. But when you have a lot of different computer modules and software modules that are communicating with each other, all those interactions are hard to show in a drawing. And so it really adds a layer of complexity to understand those interactions. So they've increased several orders of magnitude, as so have the threats and vulnerabilities across the interface boundaries. That adds another layer of complexity that we have to deal with. But really, when you look at model-based system engineering and a lot of what's involved in developing models, what you're modeling are really the critical functions that are carried out, and they're being carried out by software. And the electrical mechanical parts, the sensors and actuators, and are really enablers for what the software is doing quite a bit different than in the past. And Cozy Vision 2025 talked about this, a constant throughout the evolution of systems engineering is that ever increasingly complexity of systems which can be observed in terms of number of system functions, components, and interfaces, and their non-linear interactions and emergent properties. I'll be coming back to this several times during the presentation. An interesting article came out called How Software is Eating the Car in the IEEE Spectrum in June. Some tidbits from this. The success of today's car depends on the software more than mechanical hardware side. Uh, today, high-end cars that contain 150 electronic control units or more, while pickup trucks like just the Ford F-150 has more than 150 million lines of code. It's hard to wrap your mind around that. 40% of the cost of a new car can be attributed to semiconductor-based electronic systems, the cost doubling since 2007, and this could be up to 50% by 2030. Each new car has over $600 just of the semiconductors packed into it, consisting of up to 3,000 chips of all types. And we've read in the news, you know, one of the results of COVID is a shortage of computer chips. And a lot of those are the chips that are going in today's automobiles and trucks. And so um, there's a shortage of chips, so there's a shortage of new automobiles come off the assembly line because of that. 40% uh, or more of the vehicle's development budget from the start of its development to beginning production can be attributed to systems integration, testing, system verification, system validation, the components and associated software. The network harness can attach thousands of components. They contain more than 15 100 wires, 5,000 meters in length and weigh over 68 kilograms. Just looking at this, you see a lot of complexity 
But what's really scary is when you consider who's developing all that software and how it's managed. Nearly all the ECU design of software is outsourced to suppliers with the OEM integrating the ECUs to create the integrated system with the desired customizable functionality. Approximately 10% of the software is developed in-house. The other 90% is by as many as maybe 50 or more suppliers, each with their own development approach, their own operating systems, languages, at another level of complication, especially in performance system verification, verification validation. So you can imagine from a system integration standpoint, this is starting to get really complicated. Who's the parent that's managing all the children to make sure they all play together right, which is really the function of systems engineer. It's getting more and more difficult to do that. And again, without having some kind of integrated model of the system, this is going to be difficult to do. Sadly, individual suppliers don't have insight in how OEMs are going to integrate their ECUs together. They're just asked to provide ECU for some spec, and they do that, but how it's going to actually be used, they're integrated. Sometimes they don't have a whole lot of insight. Similarly, the OEMs have limited insight in software resident within the ECUs, which are often offered as a black box procured for a specific purpose. This is really an integration nightmare. They did a survey. How difficult is it to know when code change in one ECU affects another ECU. 30% of those surveys says it's very difficult. 31% it was very difficult. 7% says pretty darn close to impossible. And 16% that it was not possible. So again, big integration issue, which is really going to end up being a problem, not only in integration, but system validation. Each increase in functionality that's asked for in the new cars, especially as we're going to self-driving vehicles, uh, implies additional sensors, actuators, ECUs, and accompanying software, and constantly extra system integration problems, verification, validation efforts to ensure everything works correctly when integrated. Nearly 30% of defects are related to software now, and failure results from software interface faces with other electronic components or systems in a vehicle. Many recalls are because of software issue today, and increasingly hardware issues are being fixed with a software patch. Well, this gives you a good insight into a lot of our problems. This is in automobiles, but this is true in many systems, aircraft and spacecraft. So a lot of the challenges that this results in and defining managing needs and requirements across the life cycle is really more challenging in complex software-centric systems, and especially when you have a lot of suppliers being involved in building these systems. This results in increases in complexity, naturally, as we've been talking about, increase in the role software has in the system architecture. Software-centric systems are the norm. And then we have the dependency issue, number of interactions between parts of the system, the interactions between the system and the macro system as part, so all those external interfaces are a bigger issue. The number of threats correspondingly cross interface boundaries, vulnerabilities to those threats are increasingly a big problem. We've seen that in the news already with the pipeline problem that we had and the ransomware issues just more and more. So as system engineers, we have to be able to deal with these, even if not adequately addressed by customer requirements, we have to take the responsibility to make sure that we are dealing with these issues. More dependency between project management and system engineering. NCOSI has a, a joint document that they developed with PMI about integrating project management and system engineering. A lot of the artifacts need to be integrated during development. Every piece, software, hardware has a budget and a schedule associated with it. There's a product breakdown structure and be mapped to a work breakdown structure. It'd be helpful if these are managed within the same set of tools so the dependencies can be managed better. There's so many dependencies between these different system engineering lifecycle processes and activities and artifacts. When you look at the system engineering handbook in 15288, you see here's a bunch of technical processes and management processes and cross-cutting processes. And some people want to treat those as individual things that you do serially in a silo. That's not the intent. The intent is that a lot of these activities are being practiced concurrently and sharing the data between the two is iterative and recursive. So we need to change how we practice system engineering and recognize the dependencies and remove silos. This increased oversight in a lot of what we're doing for government projects. We got Congress and then for any products, we got social media and anything that goes wrong to immediately out there. So we have to deal with the increased oversight that we have, uh, increased competition for anything we're doing, the products that we're doing. 
Uh, so it's a lot more pressure to get stuff out, reduce development time, time to market, and correspondingly with this complexity come a lot more risk. There's the program of project risk, risk that happen during development, risk associated with manufacturing new systems, risk associated in, during systems integration, system verification, system validation, and operational risk. And we're having a lot more projects that are coming in over budget and experiencing schedule slips. So these challenges are real and organizations have to find some way to deal with these challenges and so they're going to have to change the way we do things. A recent article by John Malden, Technology Rules. John Malden is a financial investment expert, a lot of investment in technology companies. He's really bullish on technology and companies that are developing that. And in a newsletter he came out and says, it's remarkable how many industries and government agencies are still operating on ancient, as in 1990s technology, just muddling through. What happens when those organizations take off their old tech handcuffs? They'll run better, develop new capabilities they never had before. Customers, workers, and investors will all benefit. And I think most of the organizations really want that to happen. Humans have a comparative advantage at higher levels of abstraction, creativity, intuition, holistic judgments. Each is necessary. The best technologies do not automate complex problems. As many assume, they equip people to solve them faster and more effectively. And that's one of the promises of moving to an MBSE world, the data centric world, is that we can do things faster and better, get things to market and deal with complexity and have less issues. So we're 21 years in the 21st century. Why are so many still practicing system engineering based on outdated 20th century electromechanical document centric methodologies? You can ask your organizations these questions. Just in IS 2021, there was a paper that came out, a guide for system engineers finding your role in the 21st century software dominant organizations. I really liked what they had to say in this paper. They talked about several NCOSI dignitaries have been warning since about 2013 that if NCOSI didn't take the lead to quickly understand software and start leading in software intensive systems, the risk of becoming irrelevant. Past President Gary Roeder provided a quote by Jack Welch, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. As a support to the idea that NCOSI's rate of change must increase to match the rate of change in industry and rapidly evolving technology universe. The paper is talking about COSI, but everything that they're talking about applies equally to any organization practicing system engineering. We either adapt, move forward, or we're going to get left behind. To address these challenges, we need to change how we currently practice system engineering. Key areas I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk is needs and requirements, not just requirements. An integrated, multidisciplinary, collaborative project team approach, minimize the silos, do a lot more concurrently, managing the integrated system from the beginning, allocation of budgeting for software-centric systems, how we do allocation budgeting system subsystem approach that we've done in the past doesn't work very well so we need a different way of doing that the data centric practice system engineering i've been talking about and increased focus on validation across the life cycle so first needs and requirements and then we'll go to needs versus requirements the reason we already talked about needs and requirements is so many people today focus on just on requirements and you have requirements analysis and requirements engineering, but requirements come from someplace. They don't just come out of thin air. And there's a lot of work needed to be done if we're gonna have a good set of requirements. And work that's done before requirements is really understanding the stakeholder perspective of what they want from the system. So the needs represent the stakeholder customer acquire view of the system of interest. What do the stakeholders need the system do that result in their problem to be solved or opportunity to be realized within defined constraints, communicates the stakeholder expectations for the end state once the system is delivered in the end what will make the customers happy and I think that's what we all in the end want to have happen. And how many have read the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? I think it's the second habit is always keep the end in mind. And that's what we're trying to do as system engineers is what is that end state that we're striving for? One of the problems is we talk about system verification, system validation, but when you ask people, well, what do you actually verify against? And people say, well, the requirement. I say, okay, but what are you gonna validate against? And I get a blank look on their faces. And so the integrated set of 
needs is really what we're going to validate against, but we can't validate against them unless we've defined them and they've been baseline. So requirements represent the technical developer view of the system of interest. What must the system of interest do to meet the needs? The system of interest is then going to be verified against its design input requirements. And I put in the word design input requirements here. This comes from work I've been doing in the medical device industry. They differentiate between design inputs and design outputs. And one of the problems that we have when people are developing requirements is they tend to add implementation into the requirements. So you'll see a set of requirements and it'll be a mixture of what and how by clearly making a distinction between design input requirements and then design output specifications. It's easier for people to understand what needs to be communicated at what stage. So when we're developing requirements at this stage, we're developing really inputs into the architectural design processes. We're letting them then decide on how they're going to realize those requirements and then communicate those to the manufacturing via a set of design output specification. And you'll see that in the manual. A big thing here is requirements come from someplace. Quality requirements are dependent on the quality of the needs from which they are transformed. And the quality of the needs then is a function of the amount of work and analysis that we put into defining the life cycle concepts and the needs that come from those concepts. Rather than just focus on requirements, we must focus on both needs and requirements. Needs and requirements are the common threads that tie all SD life cycle activities together. From a holistic view of system engineering, needs and requirements must be defined and managed in the context of all other SE process areas rather than siloed distinct from other process areas. I put this in because so many people talk about requirements management tool, and that's all it does is manage just the requirements and requirements engineer, and they develop the requirements in a silo separate from other activities and people may be developing models will work on the models as a separate activity from the requirements and that's not really the intent of system engineering they need to be done concurrently in a holistic view so like the previous statement says requirements are common threads that tie everything together we have to take this holistic view of system engineering uh, in the needs and requirements throughout the life cycle needs before requirements. So I say there's a lot of work that's being done to do this. We have the stakeholders. They identify the problems and opportunities. They define the mission, goals, and objectives, measures of suitability that go with this. Stakeholders have needs and requirements and expectations. We have risk that we have to identify up front and be able to mitigate those risks. We have a lot of drivers constraints, regulations, and standards we have to show compliance with. Higher level needs, concepts, requirements that we have to that constrain what we're doing. There's existing systems that we have to interact with. There's always cost and schedule, and technology is a big thing. Uh, in the COSI guide for writing requirements, it lists characteristics of well-formed needs and requirements and sets of needs and requirements, and one of those characteristics is feasibility. But feasibility is really exists in the physical world and not as much in the conceptual model world. So if you're going to address feasibility, you really, at some point early in the program, need to go from a a functional architecture to a physical architecture, identify the functionality that needs to be done, but for each function there's performance. What are the critical technologies that are needed to achieve that performance? And then we have to assess the maturity of those technologies. And we come up with the technology readiness levels. We have to then come up with a plan to mature those technologies so that we can actually incorporate those into our design. That all has to happen early. We don't want to find that out when we start the design process after requirements. We want to find that up front. And so that's one of the, the big things that's in the manual is that in the life cycle concept analysis and maturation phase, we are starting to do some early design, some early architecture, some early physical world examination so we can identify those critical technologies. So there's a lot of work that's done before defining the requirements. So we have to elicit all this information, gather it, then we have to do analysis and maturation in that so we have at least one feasible concept. And then from that, through system analysis, we can define an integrated set of needs. And with all this work, then that helps us establish completeness, consistency, correctness, and feasibility before defining these needs and transforming those into design input requirements. So when we talk about the life cycle concept analysis and maturation, and by the way, this is not spiral development. This is the reverse. It's called the doctrine of excessive refinement, where we start with a preliminary set of life cycle concepts. Some of you may document that in the con ops or ops con, whatever you want to call it. But then uh, you develop models 
models, do analysis and maturation of the models, and then we have to transform that into the physical world. So we start doing trade space, defining candidate physical architectures. Then we do feasibility analysis, technology awareness assessment, risk assessment, do the trade studies. We zero in on a physical architecture, a corresponding set of lifecycle concepts, then increase the resolution and continue this until we have at least one feasible set of lifecycle concepts, integrated system needs, preliminary physical architecture, models, plans, budgets, and schedules. And I say set of life cycle concepts in that we're not just focusing on operation. We're talking about what's our concept for development, what's our concept for operations, what's our concept though for integration, for system verification, for system validation, for design. And so we're looking at all the life cycle concepts, concept for manufacturing, and all of these concepts could have their own set of stakeholders that we need to talk to, and they're going to result in needs and requirements that affect our system of interest. One of the problems with some modeling efforts, they focus just on use cases, some you know, the operations piece, but they don't look at all the other life cycle concepts. Also, while we're doing this, we're also looking at project management, core products and processes and concepts for how we're going to do project management, as well as system engineering concepts, including that we're going to do model-based system engineering. Once we have all this information that feeds into our integrated set of needs, then we'll go through a process to transform those needs into the design input requirements. Remember, the needs represent the perspective of the stakeholders looking at the system of interest from the outside and saying, what do we need this thing to do? What functionality, what features, there's existing systems that we have to interact with, uh, what performance do we expect, what quality do we expect? And then when that's transformed into the design input requirements, now the engineers are going to say, okay, what is our system going to have to do so we can meet those needs? We have to understand the stakeholder needs before we can define what the system interest must do to meet those needs. Rather than just having a set of requirements, we have the underlying analysis and the integrated set of needs from which they are transformed. And this can be a problem when a customer contracts out development to a supplier, gives them a set of requirements, but doesn't give them the underlying analysis from which those requirements came from, doesn't give them the needs in which to validate all the work products against. So it's no wonder sometimes suppliers have a problem being successful. The next topic is the need for an integrated, collaborative, multidisciplinary project team minimizing the silos. Rather than having separate teams that are working independent of each other, we're saying there'd be a core team of project management and system engineering personnel. And then on each of the sides, there'll be a project management and integration working group, a system engineering and integration working group. The word integration is very important because we want to manage the integrated system from the beginning. They're supported by subject matter experts and also lifecycle stage support personnel. Project management and system engineering are two sides of the same coin, so we need to find a way to work those as integrated disciplines, not as separate silo disciplines. So the team is going to be made up of experts and people who have specialty knowledge in different areas. Some people are really good in needs and requirements. People are really good in analysis using models. Some people specialize in architecture design. We have our people who are going to be involved in doing the actual manufacturing or, or coding, people involved in system integration, system verification, system validation, and we have the project management and disciplines as well. Now notice I show system integration, system validation, system verification as three distinct process areas. They are defined that way in the System Engineering Handbook in 15.288, but unfortunately, a lot of people use the term IV and V, and like it's one thing. Or you'll see in a lot of places, they talk about V and V, verification validation, as if it's one thing. It's not. It's separate things, separate processes, separate outcome. And that's one of the, the big points they're trying to make when they talk about needs and requirements. Having all these different people and part of the project team can be challenging when you have multiple suppliers like the automobile, you have, you have 50 different suppliers of just the software and the ECUs. How do you get them involved so that they know what the other people are doing? They know how their part is going to be integrated into the macro system, all the interactions between their system and other systems. Somehow we need to find a way to make that happen. That's a challenge that we present to customers is figure out how you're going to manage the system development as an integrated system, including integrating all the suppliers. And the bottom of this chart 
shows the classical system engineering V. On the top is basic system engineering process areas, slightly different names than you see in the handbook. One of the problems in the system engineering V, and there was actually on day one of the IS, there was a panel about the system engineering V. A lot of people don't like it anymore. It's kind of falling out of favor. It has its usefulness, but it has a lot of problems. Its biggest problem is that IV and V tends to be more on the right side of the V in a lot of people's minds. In reality, as shown at the top, system integration, system validation, system verification occur across the life cycle. And a lot of the upfront activities should be being done concurrently in the definition analysis and maturation applied iteratively and recursively for the different layers of architecture as we move down what's called the left side of the V, the top-down process. By doing this concurrently, it should be faster and cheaper than the classical waterfall serial document entry processes with silos. It aids establishing correctness, completeness, consistency of all the artifacts. In a document centric process, the documents are baseline at separate times. They become out of sync with each other. By doing this concurrently, having one integrated data model that represents the system of interest and the system engineering processes, we really can then say we have a single source of truth to manage from. But integration from the beginning, system integration is not just something that happens when you integrate the parts. We have to be thinking about integration throughout the life cycle. It should not be thought of as just happening on the right side. So it must be managed from the beginning. And that means also from a model basis, we have to develop an integrated model of our system in context of the macro system that's apart. If you have different subsystems develop their individual models, you're going to have problems. The basic tenets of system engineering include that the behavior behavior system is the function of the interaction of the parts. A system is greater than the sum of the whole, those kind of things. If I have a pendulum and I develop a model for it, and then I want to have a system that includes two pendulums connected together, I can't add the two models because a two pendulum system is a totally different system than a single pendulum system. I can model a car and I can model a trailer, but I can't add the two models together because when they're connected, they form a different system whose behavior will be a function of the interaction of those two pieces. It's important that we think about how we're going to manage the integrated model of the system of interest. Again, the customer supply relationship must allow this. So one of the problems we have is hierarchical view of our systems where we have different levels, level one, two, three, four, and five. And I have systems and system elements. The CNR you see in those is the concepts, needs, and requirements, which are defined for every system and system element. And so from a hierarchical view, this is one of the big strengths of system engineering is breaking things down into pieces. So we decomposition to make it easier to develop the bite-sized chunks across multiple organizational units, internal, external, based on the specialized knowledge and expertise. But notice that in this view, the interactions, the interfaces are not shown, but the focus tends to be more on the systems and system elements that make up the system of interest than the integrated system of interest. And this is not how we should do system engineering. This leads to development in silos, the system system element optimization rather than optimization of the integrated system of interest. Through the process of allocation, flow down of requirements, we are assigning certain performance attributes to each of the pieces at the next level. While the pieces may be able to do more than that, maybe we don't want them to. And that's what I'm talking about, the suboptimal performance system. The holistic view of the integrated system I showed before, the system is greater than the sum of its parts. We need to always be aware of how our piece of the system, our interest, is going to interact with other systems, system elements within the system, and how we contribute to the integrated system. So our focus is on behavior, merging properties of the integrated system based on those interactions and our interactions with the external system. And to optimize the integrated system, we may have to sub-optimize the performance of our system of interest. Now, that's kind of relative because we could say our system of interest, our, our pieces, is optimized if we can prove that it meets our allocated requirements. So an example of an integrated system model in a paper that Boeing put out in 2016 and presented at NCOCIS, they talked about that for the 787, they had an example of a large-scale system and they had over 30 companies based in countries around the world that built different portions of the airplane to help manage the complex system that developed the integrated model at over 2,000 functions, 5,000 data flows, million data parameters, 50 million objects with an average of three relationships per object. 
as well as the thousand geographically dispersed users involved in the modeling effort. This is a good example of developing that integrated system, even though you have multiple suppliers. The model is too large for any one person to comprehend what's in it. If you're responsible for a piece, you can go into the model and deal with your piece. But anything you do, you have to realize any changes you make could affect other pieces of the model. And that's one of the things that uh, come from having this integrated model. I talked about allocation and budgeting. The way we do allocating and budgeting in the hierarchical view, the, the classic flow down requirements, we have level one requirements. We assign those to the system elements at level two, and then level two does the same for level three system system elements. But it may be level four or five before we start allocating requirements to software. This leads to development of software in silos with little integration between the different software system elements. This can really cause problems. One approach that has been successful in some of my clients is to have a layer between the system of interest designed to put requirements and the subsystems. In this layer, in this case, I have hardware, mechanical software. Hardware, in this case, is defined anything that has electrons flowing through it, electronical control units, computers, actuators, and so on. Sensors would all be part of hardware. Mechanical is just that, just metal. And then software is interacting with these things. I've worked with several medical device companies that have instruments they have developed, but the instruments are multi-use. They'll take a biological sample, mix that in with some reagents, and then the assay is put into the instrument. The instrument, through an imaging system, collects data that is provided to software to analyze, and based on that analysis, they make some determination. Maybe I put in a biological sample, and it analyzes and identifies that maybe a dog has kidney failure or something. This really worked out well for them. From the instrument standpoint, there was one group that managed the instrument itself. You had scientists and chemists that did the assay, and then you had the software people developing the different kinds of software. Not only the analysis of software, but the control software, the software that the user interacted with to operate the instrument, as well as to get reports. Uh, this worked really well. And then this allocation then came down at the third level to different subsystems and systems that they decomposed their pieces to. I worked with uh, railroad companies where the second layer would be onboard systems, offboard systems, and control systems. Uh, that worked really well for them to do that initial allocation. In the case of the medical device, I may have a requirement for accuracy and precision. They would allocate that to all three pieces. The instrument plays a role, the assay plays a role, and software plays a role. So each one of those then would have to determine what's our role in meeting the accuracy and precision. I may have a requirement on total time to do an analysis. Again, all three have a role in doing that. They're going to decide what is their role, and then they'll sub-allocate that piece to the lower levels of their particular architecture. The classical decomposition architecture for hardware-centric electrical mechanical systems isn't well suited for software-centric systems. System level requiring allocation budgeting and software really should be done at this first level of allocation budgeting. The critical functionality and performance are in the embedded software, and then the hardware are really the enabling systems. Now, when we talk about embedded software, this is an interesting thing to think about also, is that a lot of colleges teach students how to to develop standalone software applications, but the concept of embedded software isn't taught very well in the universities. And from a system engineering standpoint, developing a standalone software application versus developing a system with a lot of embedded software is completely different because of all the interactions that the embedded software has with other software components as well as with the hardware components. It's really a whole different world and requires different training. And some of the approaches that people want to use for software development don't apply well when you're doing embedded software. Agile is one of those. So hardware sensors, displays, actuators, communication buses are already constraints to the software. The software is very dependent upon the hardware environment in which it is embedded. So the software isn't done independently, even though it's being developed and managed as an integrated system, still it is very dependent upon all the interaction it has with the other pieces. And that's a big difference between standalone software application and embedded is the amount of interactions that take place. The data-centric practice of system engineering, that's covered in the integrated data as a foundation of system engineering. You can look at that 
presentation on our YouTube channel. The, the basics of it is that on the top, these blue boxes, traditionally, all of these activities are done, unfortunately, in silos, different groups of people using different tools and different data and artifacts. It's really a nightmare to keep all this integrated. The basic premise is that all the, the data that represents these artifacts are put into an integrated federated shareable sets of data. And then on the bottom, all of these things are really visualizations of the common data. The single source of truth is in their federated shareable sets of data. Any changes that are made to any of the artifacts ripple through and reflected in the other artifacts. From a configuration management standpoint, this is a big change in organization. Rather than configuration managing documents or configuration managing individual artifacts, we're going to configuration manage the data set that represents those artifacts. One thing we talk about in the manuals is data centric practice system engineering. So we talk about information based needs and requirements definition. Everything is connected. On the left, we talk about needs definition. Those are transformed into requirement expressions, but we're developing models of functional models, interfaces. We have a functional architecture, which is mapped to a physical architecture. Design happens and is transformed into the engineered system. We have system verification artifacts. We have system validation artifacts. All of this needs to be linked together. The traceability is critical to document these relationships. The idea is to have traceability across the life cycle from the problem opportunity, the goals and objectives, all the constraints, life cycle concepts, the needs to the requirements, to the models, the functional architecture, physical architecture, all of our verification validation artifacts, everything is linked together within this common database. When we talk about the data-centric practice of systems engineering, the design and input quotes I'm talking about referred to as information-based needs and requirements, definition and management. That ends up with the integrated set of needs transformed into the design input requirements, focused on the problem space, and then through architecture and design processes is transformed into design output specifications, which then through manufacturing and coding are transformed into our system of interest. Well, a lot of people that say they're practicing model-based system engineering in reality start with a set the requirements and then they're really doing model-based design. What we define is that MBSC is really a combination of the information-based needs and requirements, definition and management, and model-based design. And together we have really what the intent of MBSC is. And so the last topic is increased focus on validation. So we talked about validation occurring across all the life cycle. So it's not just something we do at the end. A lot of these system engineering V models, you see that validation is against the integrated set of needs for the overall system of interest, and they don't talk about validation occurring anywhere else. And that's really wrong. What's in the manual and our products is that we're gonna validate the needs. We're gonna validate the design input requirements. We'll validate our architecture validate the design, validate design output specifications, and validate the realized system element systems and the integrated system of interest. We need to validate it against something, but the main thing is, is that validation is something that's occurring across the life cycle. By doing that, all the validation we're doing on the left side of the V is going to reduce the issues we find during system integration, system verification, system validation on the right side of the V. And if any of you are members of CAB, you notice that the goals that CAB has and has been working on for the last couple of years is just to do that. They want to see an increase in the system integration, verification, validation on the left side of the V so you can shorten the time on the right side of the V and shorten the amount of rework and issues that occur if you don't do those things. When you define an integrated set of needs, we're going to validate those against lifecycle concepts. Do they really communicate the intent of what was uncovered during our analysis and maturation of our lifecycle concepts? We want to validate do they communicate the intent of all the information that we've gathered and interfacing with our stakeholders? Uh, the lifecycle concepts themselves are going to be validated against this information. The needs verification in this context are the needs formulated as textual, structured, natural language statements appropriate for needs according to the organizational requirements for defining needs. The same with life cycle concepts will verify that they were done per the organizational requirements for how you're going to define and mature and do an analysis for life cycle concepts. Now that we have a validated and verified integrated set of needs, and they're going to be transformed into the design input requirements. 
then you can look at the big picture of verification and validation in the context. And that's one of the problems you have is people talk about verification and validation, but they don't use a context of what you're talking about. So you talk about system validation, design validation, requirements validation, or talk about production verification, design verification, system verification. Too many times people don't make clear what they're talking about. And also when you talk about verification and validation, it's always in the context, it's against something. A common problem we have is people use the phrase requirements verification when they really mean system verification that the system meets requirements. But we get lazy in our terminology and, and we confuse what we're actually talking about. This is the Rosetta Stone for understanding the context of how the terms uh, verification and validation are used. You can see the horizontal line, the common thread through all of this. We went through the life cycle needs definition processes. We end up with an integrated set of needs. Those are transformed via the design input requirements definition process. The system engineer handbook is to be called the system requirements definition process. We end up with the design input requirements or system requirements. Through the architectural design definition processes, we end up with a set of design output specifications, which then are transformed through the system implementation and integration process processes into the system of interest. And then we have system validation process, system verification processes that take place. In the next version of the system engineering handbook, you're going to see a slightly different version of this diagram to make sure that it's clear the context of system verification validation and, and how all the different technical processes fit together. System validation, the classical definition, is that validating the realized physical integrated system of interest meets its intended purpose and identify and assess behavior and emerging properties in its actual operational environment when operated by its actual intended users. This is the classic definition of system validation. In today's world, we have to add and does not enable unintended users to negatively impact the intended use of the system, ransomware, nor allow unintended users to use the system in an unintended way, hack into an airplane and cause it to crash someplace. So we, we want to avoid that. This is an increased importance of system validation that we all have to recognize is part of our job as system engineers. I often ask people, what's more important, system verification or system validation? And I talked about earlier, system validation really is making sure the customer's happy. That's the end state. However, in some areas, especially when it's a vendor that has been given a set of customer requirements, to them, system verification is all that matters. If we can verify that we met the requirements, we met our contract obligation, it's not our role to do system validation. It's the customer's role. That's faulty reasoning. For one thing, the customer should have provided the vendor a set of needs from which their requirements came from so that the supplier could actually validate against those needs and also have that underlying analysis. So in reality, project success is based on passing system validation. Passing system verification, failing system validation results in a failed project. So just saying I'm responsible for system verification, I'm not responsible for system validation, I think is not the right attitude to have. With the importance of system validation, again, we always ask, what do you validate against? Where is it defined? And we're saying it's in the integrated set of needs. Who defines it? The customer is going to need to define it. Or if the customer hasn't, then the vendor has to. That's one of the issues in how we approach getting customer requirements, how we deal with customer requirements. Some organizations feel that we're going to implement the customer requirements directly. We're going to allocate those to architecture and we're going to go and and build systems. But in reality, the customer requirements often are incomplete, inconsistent, incorrect, may not even be feasible. And the customer requirements are not the only set of requirements that we have to meet. Our internal organization is going to have requirements, business requirements we have to meet. There's going to be other stakeholders involved across the life cycles. They're going to have needs and requirements that we have to address. So in reality, the customer requirements are just inputs into the whole process. And so we're going to take the customer requirements along with other needs and requirements from stakeholders. We're going to have to do our driver's constraint analysis, our risk analysis. We're going to have to develop life cycle concepts for how we're going to actually approach this project. Out of that will come an integrated set of needs that's integrated in that it addresses not just the customer requirements, but all the other stakeholders. And then we'll transform those into a set of design input requirements that we're going to actually build to. Those input requirements will trace to the needs they transform from and any of them associated with allocated parent system requirements that we'll trace to those as well. Then from a system validation standpoint, 
point, who's responsible? The customer only, or is it a shared role between the customer and the suppliers? If there is a statement of work, supplier agreement, all of these questions need to be addressed in the statement of work, made very clear. Too often they're not, resulting in very costly contract changes. The bottom line is defining up front in the contracts what is necessary for acceptance and in what form is the necessary acceptance being defined. Uh, and this must be clear in all the customer supplier agreements. That is the end of the presentation. Lou, thank you for presenting today. I always enjoy uh, hearing what you have to say. <laughs> Yes, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, everything in this presentation is underlying concepts that are in the needs requirements verification validation lifecycle manual and the other two products. If you're a member of the client working group, you can go to the Connect site and you'll see you know the draft versions of all these products and you can download those and start using them now if you want. And if you do review them and have any comments, please feel free to send me an email and let me know what your comments are. Oh, will do. Thanks. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, thank you, Lou. I think it was a really good presentation. I delved really deeply into how it maps to MBSC and its relevancy in terms of the, the data and the management of data versus just configuration management. So very good. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. And I think that's it for our meeting today.